Good afternoon and welcome to Upstart Live. We have a massive show for you today. I'm your host, Naeem Kurt. And I am his co-host, Ben McCready. And we're here and we are ready to bring you all the news and action over this next hour with the Upstart Live crew. You may notice our voices are a little different to the ones who normally bring you the show. Lisa and Ahmed have been kind enough to let us steer the ship for a while. So for the next two weeks, we'll be hosting the show and hopefully keeping the show to the very high standard they have set. That's right. And for today's show, we're bringing you live into the CBD with, uh, to speak with homeless groups who have been protesting this week over housing affordability. We are also speaking with Matthew Elmas, who will be joining us for the weekly roundup of everything federal politics, courtesy of Unipol Watch. And we'll also be taking a close look at an initiative from Greyhound Racing Victoria called The Gap. That's the Greyhound Adoption Program. So prepare yourselves for dogs being cute. We also have a story on the Melbourne Webfest launch and an interview with Australian Paralympian Ahmed Kelly as he gets ready for the Rio Paralympics in a few months' time. But first, we have Kyle... Uh, with the big headlines. Hi, Kyle. Take it away. Thanks, Ben. Fallout over immigration, another plane disappearance, heavy floods and pizza. Hello, I'm Kyle Humphreys and this is Upstart Media News. The fallout from the immigration minister's comments are continuing. Peter Dutton has been slammed for saying refugees were illiterate and taking local jobs. He said Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull is rock solid in the support of his views towards immigration. The Greek Defence Minister has released information on the last moments before the Air Egypt flight MS-804 crashed into the sea. He said the plane took violent turns left and right before dropping quickly into the Mediterranean. The crash, which killed all 66 on board, is still under investigation with no hypothesis ruled out. At least 37 people have died in Sri Lanka as heavy rains has caused floods and landslides. 300 millimetres of rain has fallen on the country since Saturday and 350,000 people are estimated to be affected. A convoy with opposition leader Bill Shorten was involved in a collision in the Hunter Valley last night. A woman swerved to overtake the convoy before hitting an oncoming car. The ALP leader was in Cessnock to talk about the condition of the roads. Nobody was injured in the crash. Telstra's MBN and ADSL has suffered another network failure this morning. 375,000 phone and internet customers across the country have been affected in the outage. This is the latest in a horror 12 months for the Tyco giant. Naples has broken a Guinness World Record. The Italian city has made the world's longest pizza. It measures in at 3 kilometres and took 100 chefs 11 hours to make. In weather, it will be overcast all day today in Melbourne with a top of 17 degrees. The weekend will be the same with tops of 19 for Saturday and 21 for Sunday. Now in sport, Steph Curry's Golden State Warriors have drawn their Western Conference playoff series after beating Oklahoma 119-91 to yesterday. A third quarter blitz from Curry saw him score 15 points in two minutes. The series is level 1-1 with the third game at Oklahoma Sunday morning Australian time. Friday night football sees Hawthorne take on Sydney in a blockbuster at the MCG. Sydney will be looking to bounce back from there after the siren loss to Richmond last week while Hawthorne will be looking to keep in touch with the top four. There will be a comprehensive sports wrap a bit later in the show but now back to you Kurt and Ben. You're listening to Upstart Live. It's three mi- four minutes past one o'clock. Now, I believe we're crossing to Sasha Doherty, who is out at City Square talking to a group of homeless protesters. Sasha, Sasha, are you there? Yes, I am here. Sasha, where are you exactly at the moment? I am at the City Square um, with my co, I guess, colleague, Lisa, and we're talking to John Alexander. And what's been happening at City Square at the moment? Okay, so there's been a protest. This is day nine. Um, It's getting bigger every day. Uh, These guys are here protesting for uh, permanent housing, better conditions. Um, They've also been told to get off the streets. So, you know, where are they meant to go is, I guess, the big question. And the protest has been continuing since last Thursday. What's the latest at the moment? I believe there was a press conference held with the Mayor of Melbourne, uh, Robert Doyle. Was there any information you got from that? 
Um, at this stage, I haven't been on top of that, to be honest, but I have spoken to some people here about that, um, which it's not been a positive uh, outcome. They are not happy. They've been served with eviction notices. Um, there's been threats from the council at very early hours of the morning to um, remove their, I guess, temporary shelters. So now they have to sleep open air with no uh, no tarps. They're not allowed either. Um, the threat of removing a, a kitchen that's been here for five years on and off feeding the homeless has also been, a, you know, threatened to be removed. So I've got John here if you uh, don't mind me having a word with him. Yeah, pass it on to John. All right. Joining us. Um, look, why did he swear? Well, it is right across from uh, Town Hall. It's an easy place for us all to meet up at, and it's also a public place. So it's right in the media's eye. And what's the hope or the outcome at day nine? Well, it's the same result that we wanted from day one, which is to try and address and fix the problems of homelessness as well as try and get a roof over everyone's head. And I've noticed that there's a lot of goods that have been donated. Have you had a lot of interest from the public? Oh, yeah. We've had so much support from the public. We've had people coming in day in, day out, telling us messages of support, even children coming from schools to give us supplies just to show us how much they support us. And just on another note, can you explain the $700,000 that the government are talking about that they've given or will give you? Well, it depends on what paper you read, because one will say 600000 one will say 700 another will say 750 We personally, we were told it was 750000 which is going to launch housing for an outreach program to find the people that are already here. So what's that money really for? Okay, and so day nine, how long do you think this will go on for, or how long are you guys willing to continue the protest? We have no idea how long this will go for, but we will be here however long it takes. John, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. There you go, Kurt. Thank you very much, Sash. Is John still there? Uh, he is. Do you want to talk to him? We wanted to ask him a short question. Just what's his story about how he became no homeless? All right, I'll put him on for you guys. Hello, Kurt. Hi, uh, we were just interested in your story. How did you, your own personal story, how did you become homeless? Um, well, really it's a, a combination of issues, but I'd say most, the, the biggest impact would have been mental health. Yeah, and it's been such a big issue recently, mental health. We've had an Australian of the year, Patrick McGorry, who has uh, been really advocating in the past for mental health. Do you think... Uh, do you feel that there's enough services out there available to homeless people? From my personal experience, there is definitely not enough out there. How did your uh, mental health issues lead to you becoming homeless? Um, honestly, that, that's a really long story and it, it, I just wouldn't have time to get into it right now, sorry. Not a problem, John. We might come back to that at a later date. Thank you so much for okay, your time. Okay, beautiful. Thank you very much. You have a great day. You too. Thank you. Bye. There we have... Uh, oh, Sasha's still on the line. Sorry, sorry, guys. I just wanted to say um, thanks for the interest and we'll speak to you soon. Thank you so much, Sasha. Bye. And that was Sash Doherty in Melbourne uh, looking at the, the protests surrounding the homelessness uh, issues that have been occurring lately. Um, so you're listening to Upstart Live. It's, uh, we show every Friday from 1pm uh, onwards. Uh, the time is now nine past one, and now we have a really, really big interview with uh, Mr. Ahmed Kelly, who is sitting right across from us. Ahmed, how are you doing? I'm doing really well, thank you. We should probably note that Ahmed Kelly is a Paralympian. He will be competing in Rio. He's previously competed at the London Paralympics, and he's also a Latrobe alumni as well. So... Uh, Ahmed Kelly, of course, in Australia, we love uh, we love stories of the underdog in sport. We love stories of players who triumph through adversity. How have you came to be involved as a Paralympian? What's your story to getting here today? Well, I, I have a quite unique story, but um, one that I'm being so blessed for as well because I actually fell into sports and I, I think 
the main purpose of me coming to Australia was to have a medical operation on my legs. That's that's all it was. And then once it was all fixed up and I was able to walk like everybody else, which is what I wanted to do, uh, then I was pretty much going back to Baghdad, Iraq. So that's where I came from. Uh, at I was Mother say, you were born in, in Baghdad. Yeah, so right? I was born in Baghdad um, at a Mother Teresa orphanage and they were fantastic what they've been able to do. But in 2000, uh, Moira, who I call mum now, so most of you know her, Moira Kelly, and wonderful humanitarian, does amazing work. Been she she got Australian of the Year, I believe. Yeah, point. she yeah. was, absolutely. And she's br- been bringing out kids from all over the world who need, need life-saving or life-changing operations. And she's able to do that through a charity that she was able to uh, set up, uh, the Children First Foundation. Now she's done everything she can for them and has moved on to create another smaller charity. And um, so we're quite excited about that. Um, so that's just been a long thing that she, on the list of things. that She's also got the Global Garden of Peace that she's trying to get up and going, which is basically trying to build a garden in Gaza, So, which is amazing because the kids in Gaza don't really have much uh, to play around with. So she's that's one of her projects. But anyway... So, uh, it sounds like quite a project, yeah. It's a, it's a huge project, and what she's been able to do is just quite extraordinary. She's been able to get a lot of people behind her to make it happen, which is great. So uh, it's still got a long way to go, but she's quite um, hopeful that it'll do well. So basically, bringing myself out, as well as my brother Emmanuel, as most of you would know, who who would have who was in the uh, 2011 X Factor. So he loves his singing and wants to pursue that as a career so he's doing well he's still got a long way to go but he'll get there eventually which is great that's such a, a huge difference between you and your brother like you, you've gone professional sports he's gone professional entertainment and, i know and I, I guess there's no competition between us that way so yeah yeah <laughs> which well, is a good right. thing but uh no i try and have some sort of singing talents here and there but nothing as good as his but i focus in the pool more i mean if i could ask how did you get involved in swimming specifically in that sport yeah, so it was sort of an accident, to be honest with you, because when I got my prosthetic legs and I uh, got healed, uh, all I ever wanted to do was just join in any sports because I loved sports. Uh, the team sports were more of a thing for me. And so I ended up doing basketball. I ended up doing uh, a bit of down ball, a bit of cricket, all those sort of things, and nothing with any limits because I had these prosthetic legs and uh, nothing was stopping. There's like no pains or aches. Uh, so thanks to the operation, I was able to do all, all that and really enjoy it. And basically, it wasn't until my mum got uh, tickets to go see Essendon versus Brisbane Lions at a um, at Etihad Stadium, and I, I'd never really been to a big football game. And I was just inspired and really in awe of how this game was being played. I walked away thinking, this is exactly what I want to do. I want to play Aussie Wolves footy and <laughs> I wanted to train hard, work, do whatever it is for me to get on a team to play footy. And that's pretty much what I ended up doing is um, I went home, started practicing day in, day out. And um, before you know it, I'm in grade six, trying out for the grade six footy team, did really well there and got to play. And uh, basically my job there was to do, do the one percenters. And I love that because I didn't, there was no, uh, there was no big, burden of me oh I've got to win that uh win the game for the team and all that so all I wanted to do is the one percenters that help the team win win a game so I was a loose man uh occasionally played full forward which was great kicked a few goals and then I went on to play for Assumption College um Kilmore Swim- uh, Kilmore Football Club as well so that was great fun just to really um expand on the footy career which is great that's incredible. I can't even kick a goal. So, so <laughs> you know, that's, that's yeah, you, you, you've impressed me just by saying you can kick goals. That's awesome, man. Some of our yeah. viewers are listening over the webcast. Could you explain to them what your disability is, just to make it clear to our viewers? Yeah, so I've got no arms um, and legs, so it's what you call a double amputee. Uh, and basically I've got prosthetic legs, but I don't have any prosthetic, uh, prosthetics arms because I pretty much do everything with, without the arms, which is great. So that's, that's by choice. But no that's by arms. choice. Yeah. Cause I pretty much do everything and, um, I've learned to adapt as well to whatever the situation was, whatever really the challenge is thrown at me. So I know it's a lot of patience and I, uh, you have to be quite determined as well. And that's what makes me so grateful because I know I've got so many people who can help me but they're not always going to be there and I've got to learn to be able to live on my own or be able to do things independently and that's something that mum really tried to teach me when I was pretty young as well. 
I love that you call her mum. That's just, just <laughs> tugs at the she heartstrings. Is, that we've way. got yeah. the Paralympics coming up now, and where are you at in uh, your preparations for that? I believe you've done your time trial, I think, and you've got the team announcement is in July. Yeah, so we've already had the Australian Swimming Championships, which is our selection trials for both the Olympics and the Paralympic swimmers. Uh, so that was back in April in Adelaide, and that was quite intense, but it was a great atmosphere. Adelaide did such a good job. I walked away with a good qualifying time. I'm still not quite on the team yet, so we have to wait for the official announcement f- by, by the APC, Australian Paralympic Committee. When are so you that, expecting that announcement? I'm expecting that. Oh, we've been told it should be around July, so okay. early July. So a little bit so, of time to go. So a little bit of time to go, and uh, but I'm still training really hard because, as I said, I swam pretty well in Adelaide, so I'm quite confident, but anything could happen, so yeah. What does your training regime entail? We know you're a student as well at La Trobe. How much time do you spend studying and how much are you focusing on training as well? Well, that's a great question because swimming is not going to be forever and you've got to think uh, of what you're going to do after your um, sporting career. So for me, I've always had a great interest in sports and I still want to be part of it even after I retire from swimming, well, God knows when that will be, but it uh, won't be any time soon yet. But basically what I want to try and do is take academically serious. So at La Trobe, I do it part-time uh, because if you do things, uh, for instance, if you do full-time study, trying to do full-time training, you're going to be, go, end up going crazy. And in terms of lots of stress, in terms of... You need to have a proper life balance, don't you? You do. And um, basically, you end up uh, doing well in one thing and not the other. And that's not who I am. I want to try and do as best as I can on both fields. And the only way to do that is to buy some time. So you do study part-time, uh, swimming full-time. And then when swimming doesn't require a lot of demand from me, you take up study full-time and put sports uh, second. So, so at the moment, you're focuses a lot more on the training side absolutely of the Olympics, so or Paralympics coming up absolutely so I've deferred uni for the year pretty much so I can stay focus on working as well as training full what's time. the training schedule like so I train about 11 sessions a week from Monday to Saturday I get Sunday off which is great so that's the <laughs> rest of recovery day for me <laughs> but uh it is quite intense but it, it's what you have to do to get those top three finish and that's exactly what I'm targeting is a top three finish at the Rio Paralympic Games. I mean London was great for me to be part of it and compete but now I just want to do a little bit better than just competing. We were speaking earlier about some of the rivalries out there. Who is your competition in at Rio to getting yeah. that gold medal, silver, bronze medal? It is a fierce competition in the SB3 category which is the my category for the 50 metre breaststroke and at the moment there's all sorts of countries or athletes that could take that number one so i'm competing against italians um the spanish and the japanese so you've got to expect the unexpected that's for sure and i'm definitely trying to be as prepared as i can to uh really give myself a best chance to win that gold medal i mean if somebody had come to me you know with with a young ahmed kelly and said you know, show this young boy how to play football, how to play AFL. I would have been the kindest person who said, I don't know how. I don't know how I could. I don't know if I can. What What would you say to that kind of person? To the, the I don't think he can do it. Well, that's, when you say you don't think he can do something, that's automatically a negative attitude. Right. Okay, so you, you, you tell them, okay, watch how this person does it. And you ask them, how do you think you can do it? And you tell them to try and adapt to what your abilities are, and this is all I've been doing in my life. I've been watching how people do things, and I've said, okay, what is my strength, and how can I accomplish this task or this challenge? And you watch them as close as you can. Now, you're not always going to get it right straight away. I mean, that's failure, and people are always afraid of failing straight away. And the only way to be successful is to fail and work out, okay, this is not how you do it. This is how we might have to do it next time. And all those sort of things. So I'd be telling my young Amu Kelly Kalmud, watch very closely how they do it. And it's okay if you're going to make a mistake first up, but just learn from those mistakes and do it as best as you can. Figure out what your strengths are and go for it. I've read a lot that uh, your inspiration really is for your two sisters to show them the way of how you can achieve anything you want to be. I want the girls uh, who are amazing and what they've been able to overcome in the last few years, it's unreal. But... And now that they, if they do look up to me, and I don't think they do. Uh, You've got I wa- two famous sisters as well. Could I you know, Trish and Krishy, yeah. So you would have all known uh, Trish and Krishna from their big separation in 2009. I mean, they've they've had a lot of operation prior to that. They were conjoined twins? Yeah, they're previously conjoined twins. 
and they've had a lot of operations prior to that m massive one that you all know about, uh, the big marathon uh, that actually ended up separating the girls. But uh, what they've been able to achieve, uh, what they've been able to achieve from that operation is unreal right now. So we've got Krishna going to um, school, and we've got Trisha also going to school, which is fantastic. Both girls are doing swimming. Uh, Trishna is doing a bit of tennis, so there's this bit of sport in in her life as well. And now we have Krishna who can also walk, which is uh, with the help of a walker. And it's just been amazing what they've been able to get through. So we still want them to do better and better, but. I want them to look up to me and say, okay, there should be nothing that's stopping you. If you really want to do something, do your very best and work hard and you'll get there. I've heard your nickname is Liquid Nails. How did that come about? <laughs> yeah, well, as I said, I played footy before swimming and when I turned to swimming, because at, at the end of the day, I was told to stop playing football. And when you get told to stop doing something you absolutely love and so passionate about, it hurts. And I had no idea what to do for a while. And then it wasn't until APC, Australian Paralympic Committee, had this talent identification day. And it basically allowed athletes with a disability to try all the different sports that you could compete at the Paralympic Games. So I went on, along to this day because I've been told to stop playing football and I thought I still had a lot to offer in the sporting world. So I basically said, okay, try all the different sports and you never know what you could do. So I tried all of them. I did well with athletics because of footy background. I did well in cycling and then swimming. And I mean, there was always a push from mum to do swimming and I just wasn't quite uh, sold on it. And I thought, okay, well, it's something I'm okay at and it's something I need to work on. And then I had a good friend um, uh, at Assumption College and she was an amazing swimmer. And, uh, and some of them would know her as Tamara and she, she was so good that you, uh, you drew some inspiration from that. So I thought, okay, I'll take on swimming and get to learn from the best at that time. And uh, because I changed the swimming, my, all my friends called me Liquid Nails because when I was nails at the uh, football club, went in as hard as nails. Now that I'm a swimmer, I had to be Liquid Nails, which is pretty funny, I thought. That's, that's actually quite <laughs> I cool. mean, what could you do with Ahmed? So that's what they had to come up with, nails. Uh, and then, yeah, Liquid Nails for the swimming, which is great. You are listening to Upstart Live. Uh, my name's Ben McCready, and I'm co-hosting with Naim Kurt. Yeah, we run every Friday from 1 p.m. It is currently uh, 22 minutes past one. We're sitting with Ahmed Kelly, who's who's regaling us with, with some really inspirational stuff. Um, Ahmed, who, have you got other inspiration that you draw from? You just said Tamara, you know, who, who else inspires you whilst you inspire everyone Yeah, so Tamara else? was in the early days of starting swimming, but now I've been able to draw inspiration from my mum, who does an amazing work as well. For I mean, she just never stops. Uh, in swimming at the moment is Grant Patterson. Uh, some of you know Scooter, and he lives in Cairns. Uh, he does a fantastic job. He's just a, such a hardworking man. I'm also privileged to call him as one of my best friends, which is great. And he always checks up on all the swimmers to see how they're going and how's their training, all that sort of stuff. So he's a good man, great sense of humour, and um, as I said, they're great people to look up to. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Taking it back to the Paralympics, can you explain to us what's the... Paralympics like when you get there? I mean, how is, it, how is it in the village? How is life outside of the competing on the field or in the pool? It is quite an extraordinary experience. And it's one that you know that you're very, I mean, it's hard to really describe what the feeling is, but you're like, wow, all this hard work. And then you get to enjoy this amazing competition and I mean it's not over you still got to do the work but it's just an amazing feeling to walk in there you got all sorts of different athletes all different disabilities and we've all had to work hard to get there I mean no one's just there by luck how's the com camaraderie in the the camp yeah so I mean we all have um staging camps prior to coming to yep. the Olympic Village so we all get to know each other and have the really this is good, the Australian team this is the Australian teams yep. Uh, whether it's swimming, um, athletics, they all have staging camps prior to it. And I'm pretty sure the other countries do the same thing. But it's great to build that great, uh, team camaraderie and knowing that you can um, rely on your teammates if you're having a good day or a bad day. It's just great. And uh, we're all buzzing coming into the village. And as I said, it's quite an extraordinary atmosphere. And you got, I mean, Brazilians are quite ex uh, exciting uh, team and they always ha have a lot of fun here and there. So it's important that you keep track of it all and keep it in check because you're there to compete and not to get too absorbed with the party mode. 
there are some parties though that come <laughs> towards the end of the Paralympics. They do, but if you're if you're racing, if you still got competition, you are still uh, asked to really focus, and and that comes down to the athlete. You've got to be able to say, okay, I'm still competing. Uh, it's my responsibility to um, make sure that I'm, I'm focused and you doing were, the routines. You were speaking earlier with us about uh, being a professional athlete and having your own personal life as well. How do you balance that, especially with social media today and athletes needing to promote themselves? How, how do you manage that? As I said, it's very important that you do put them aside, like what, what your professional careers are and all that stuff. You, you, do, you don't want that to collide with your private life um, because... At the end of the day, I still got to be able to have a cup of tea or coffee with my friends and not be, not not share all that with the whole world at the end of the day. So, I mean, yeah, very important as athletes is that you can separate professional and um, private life. Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of uh, of the time management, we we are unfortunately operating on a on a very limited schedule. But look, it's been absolutely great having you here, Arvid. Um, thanks, Ben. No, it's been good to be on the show, and thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Fi- we finally got around to getting you on. Uh, it's been a, a several month long endeavour at this point, I, I believe. So my apologies for that. <laughs> it's Not been quite uh, well. I think it was our. We end. wish you all the best for the Paralympics. I'm sure everyone here at La Trobe and Australia is wishing you the best, and we hope you get a medal for yourself and for the country. Oh, thank you so much and thanks to all the listeners and uh, hopefully you can get on board with the Paralympics and uh, you can watch it on Channel 7 from September 7. So it's not too far away. It's about 110 days away. So keep track on that. We'll mark it down in our diaries, definitely. (laughs) Good on you. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ahmed. You're listening to Upstart Live, live from every Friday from our studios. It's 26 minutes past one. I believe we have Matthew Elmers coming in from Uni Pole Watch. I believe so too. Uh, possibly. We are not sure, not quite sure where he is just yet. Ah, uh, uh, Matthew. Is. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, Matthew. No worries. Great to be here. Uh, now, you're running the Uni Pole Watch. They're doing the election coverage of the federal election. We're now mm-hmm. into the second week of the federal election. Mm-hmm. Uh What's been the big stories this week that have been happening? Well, uh, this week's actually been pretty interesting. So we've had David Feeney um, come out with a lot of issues in relation to the fact that he owns four properties uh, and that he negatively gears one of them and that even that one of them wasn't declared. So uh, that's been in the wider media. Uh, that's been quite prevalent. But what we, we, should, we should note that you are covering the Batman electorate pretty in- intensely for the mm-hmm. uh, Unipol Watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, we're focusing on it quite uh, intensely. We haven't really run that much stuff in relation to uh, Feeney because obviously the bigger publications have been covering it quite extensively. But one thing we have been looking at that I wanted to talk about was uh, an emerging election issue in the electorate, which is the Darabin and Mary Creeks. Yes. So there's an issue in the electorate, in the electorate uh, with both of these creeks. They run through the electorate on the west and east side of the electorate. And uh, in 2011... They actually came out uh, as some of those polluted uh, uh, creeks in the whole of Victoria. Um, so it's quite a big issue. Uh, Alex Patola, the Greens candidate, has committed as an election commitment to trying to make the creeks clean enough so people can swim in them again. And David Feeney is now under increasing pressure from environmental groups in the area to act on the issue and do something about it. So it's definitely an emerging election issue that uh, we're definitely keeping an eye on um, and we're drumming up some coverage on that that we should get out in the few, next few weeks. In writing what the Greens policy is on Mary Creek, how they're going to reduce the pollution there? Yes, I do. So um, Alex Patel has said previously uh, that she would address pollution in the creeks through working with uh, local groups that have already kind of started to try to clean up the creek on their own. Um, but through the through the green Green's wider policy, she said that she will advocate uh, for more funding to go to environmental bodies at a federal level um, that will trickle down, I guess. We know Batman is one of these kind of non-traditional battlegrounds where it's turning out to be a battle between Labor and the Greens party rather than a traditional Mm -hmm. Labor-Liberal battle. How much are the minor parties going to play a role in this election? We know the PUP Mm -hmm. had a huge vote across Australia Mm -hmm. at the last federal election. They've diminished quite significantly as a party. Yeah. Well, 
what's really interesting with the minor parties is that after the Senate voting reforms, they've come out and said, well, the minor party alliance led by Glenn Drury have come out and said that they're going to start targeting some of these seats like Batman to kind of prevent the Greens from gaining too much momentum in retaliation for the, supporting the reforms. So it's been mentioned in the media that it's suggested that minor parties will be preferencing Labor over mm. Greens and the Liberals. They made a deal together in the Senate. Yeah, so... Uh, Do you have any evidence of that? Well, so the minor parties we've talked to so far, um, it's actually very interesting, especially the sex party, who are a really good example of uh, what might happen in Batman. They are, they're they a pretty significant party in that electorate as far as the minor parties go, um, especially now that Palmer United's kind of yep. disbanded a bit. Um they're actually, they've actually said they haven't really decided on their preferencing yet. Uh, they have nothing set in stone. Um, and they've also said that they, they won't be doing what's in the interest of the minor party alliance. They'll be doing what's in their interests. And talking to a lot of other minor parties, that's the same thing that the rest of them, they, they've said as well, the Animal Justice Party, you know, parties like that have said very similar so things. So this talk of them directing their preferences to Labor isn't eventuating from what you've um, been yeah, able to find out. From from the parties that, you know, I've been talking to uh, over the last few months, it's definitely the case that this whole story of minor parties preferencing Labor isn't, definitely isn't, you know, united in any way, shape or form. How much do you think this controversy with David Feeney having is a couple of extra investment properties? Mm-hmm. How much will that play out and uh, affect the Batman outcome? Yeah, well... What's interesting about Batman uh, is that when we've been looking at the data in the last few weeks is that in the south part of the electorate, the uh, the people who are earning more money uh, every week uh, are actually voting green and the people in the north uh, are yeah, voting Labor. Yeah, far north, it's all Labor. Exactly. And far south, it's green. Yeah. And it's kind of that Bell Street yeah, divide. Yeah, the there. Bell Street divide. And actually, we've actually drawn up a few charts in the last, uh, in the last actually, last night that pretty clearly show where that intersection is. And so... Uh, hopefully I'll be able to talk about that uh, in the next couple of weeks. But as far as Feeney's concerned and as far as the uh, houses go, I think we'll have to wait and see what kind of an effect that has, uh, at least on the polling in I'm the assuming area. you got the breaking news last night regarding the Greens leader, Richard mm-hmm. Di Natale, who was also found out to have extra properties that he didn't declare, one of his mm-hmm. family properties out in uh, rural Victoria. Yep. And he was also found out to be supposedly underpaying people yep. to come work in as nannies for his yeah look after his two children definitely so there's a few skeletons in the closet yeah. for all of the candidates do you yeah. think um the allegations around richard di natale are mm. going to uh neutralize the concerns over david well, Feeney, the criticisms of him i guess what's interesting is from that perspective that di natale being a victorian senator is an alex patal and alex patal kind of stands on her own record um and as somebody that's been a member of the community for 30 years she she's become kind of her own figure within the electorate so i i think whilst the green vote will definitely uh especially if what has been said about di natale in relation to him underpaying workers i think it was something like 150 dollars a week yes um if that turns out to be true if that's corroborated then i think that might definitely hurt the greens vote but um i think it'll have less of an impact on the electorate of batman than david feeney who is the personal mp for that seat uh not declaring things and negatively gearing properties just finally uh there was some breaking news last night as well about raids being conducted on certain mm-hmm. alp staffers in victoria mm-hmm. what's your opinion on that and how do you think that's going to play out over the next few weeks yeah, the well, raids were conducted as well about NBN yeah. uh, documents being... Uh, yeah, it's um quite interesting. Malcolm Turnbull's come out this morning and he's kind of stressed the independence of the AFP. Uh, Labor have come out and kind of tried to purvey it out as a bit of a stitch-up job. But uh, it'll it'll I think these kind of things are early on in the campaign. Uh, it'll be very difficult to see them really carrying too much weight forward. These things will blow over in the next few weeks. Um, I don't... I don't think four or five weeks out from the campaign uh, or six weeks kind of we're coming into the f- five weeks now is long enough that that kind of stuff will tail off and we'll start getting more policy announcements in the next month that will start dominating the rhetoric. So um, I don't think it'll hurt them too much. I think more important for them is the concerns that in their party over asylum seekers and things like that that will continue to dog them. So Yeah. Oh, there you go. So that was the... Uh what do we call it? The Uni Poll Watch with Matt Elmas. Thank you for coming in, Matt. No, thank you for having me. Anytime, anytime. You're listening to Upstart Live. We're live every Friday from our studio starting at 1pm. It's now 26 minutes to 2. 
I'm Niam Kurt, and this is... And I'm Ben McCready. And next up, we have a bit of an interesting story uh, about greyhound adoption, I think, Kurt, don't we? Greyhound adoption, yes. I think uh, Matthew Coburn has put through a story on greyhound adoption, which is an initiative created to house greyhounds that are no longer suitable for racing and as a way to combat the issues of dogs being destroyed after their racing careers are over. Matthew Coburn, who, by the way, is our technical operator, brings us this story. Greyhound Racing Victoria, and we've been set up to look after greyhounds that are not suitable for racing. So dogs that aren't fast enough or they're retired or dogs like this puppy who've got something wrong with them. So we look after them and find new homes for them. So a lot of um, people, when they go to the pound, they don't really know what dog... Recently in the media, greyhound racing hasn't got the best rap. With scandals such as the live baiting, the industry recently has been slandered. However, today we are here to see a different side of this story. We are here at Greyhound's Adoption Program's biggest day in history, where over 70 ex-race greyhounds are here to find a new home. With all those working towels in one place, it's going to be hard not to pick one up myself. Let's go have a look inside. So what the Greyhound Adoption Program is, we're a department of Greyhound Racing Victoria and we've been set up to look after greyhounds that are not suitable for racing. So dogs that aren't fast enough or they're retired or dogs like this puppy who've got something wrong with them. So we look after them and find new homes for them. So a lot of um, people when they go to the pound they don't really know what dog they're getting whereas Gap always makes sure that the dog that you take home is hopefully going to be perfect for you. We ask questions like what other animals they've got, if they've got young children, uh, if they've got a cat, if they work full time and then because we get to know our dogs we see which is the most appropriate dog for that home. Would you mind just telling us who we have here? Okay, we've got, we've got Cuddles and Hugs and Buddy. Is there any reason the puppies are in the program? They have a few little health issues but nothing major so they've just come in and they're ready to go be adopted by home. I just come to uh, support the, the adoption of greyhounds because I, I think they're beautiful dogs and there's so many that need homes. We've had friends that had greyhounds that raced um, but they turned them into pets and just said they were really a really good pet so my wife's been really keen on having one ever since then. Uh, we've previously had a greyhound that unfortunately we lost about a month ago. So we've just come to have a look and interested in getting another one. We saw some beautiful ones, but they were snapped up so quickly we're thinking we're going to have to wait for the afternoon session or just get online. Our whole thing is just one that's active and wants to play with the kids and yeah, have a big couch for it. Do you think events like this help paint a different side, a different picture of greyhound racing? Yeah, I hope so. And we do hold them at tracks. Um, we're not ashamed of our association with the industry. We're part of Greyhound Racing Victoria and we're part of the solution rather than the problem. So um, I think what, what people need to realise is it's actually the racing that makes them such a great pet. It's like being um, a bit like in boot camp in the army. The dogs are handled by a whole lot of different people. Um, they Because of that, they're really well adjusted, easy to manage, straightforward dog and they make a wonderful pet. I personally don't follow greyhound racing, I like them as dogs and pets and I think they need they need as much help as they can and, and I think it's down to the racing industry so if this can do good then I'm, I'm all for it. As long as the, the animals I think enjoy it, um, who knows, I think the owners probably know better than we do um, if they're enjoying doing their work, uh, that's my opinion, I think there's nothing wrong with it uh, as long as they get treated right. That's the main thing. Amongst all the dogs up for adoption today, one was found that hit a little bit closer to home. My own ex-racing greyhound, Shaz, was up for adoption and we managed to track down her new owner, Alan, and asked him why he picked Shaz. Uh, we just uh, looked on the website first and had a look through the a lot of the dogs and she should appeal to us and the first dog we walked up to and we said yes. <laughs> uh, what's the home life situation going to be for Shaz? Have you got any other dogs or do you have a, a, play, a bed for her already? I uh, haven't got a bed for her because we weren't sure if we we're going to get a dog today but um, we have um, another dog which is a um, Cavalier so we believe she's pretty placid and then they'll join in and have a lot of fun. It's lovely to meet her new owners and see that she is going to a good home. Out of all 70 greyhounds, each one was adopted to a new home today, making the day a success and adding a new member to many families. This has been Matt Coburn for Upstart Life. And that was our Greyhound, Greyhound Adoption Program story um, presented by Matthew Coburn, uh, again, who is our technical operator. Uh, you are listening to Upstart Live, screen, uh, streaming out of Trobe University every Friday. It's currently uh, 20 minutes to two. Um, and coming up, we have a story about the Melbourne Web Fest um, and also our Upstart segment with Rudy Edsel. Um, you can follow us at uh, Upstart Magazine on Twitter, uh, so please go ahead and do that. That's always fun. Uh, but right now, 
We are here to talk about the Melbourne Web Fest, uh, which has been running annually since 2013, and uh, 2016 is shaping up to be its biggest year yet. Late last week was the Web Fest launch party, which announced the festival's award nominees. Marilena Dalman has the story. The launch event for the Melbourne Web Fest kicked off late last week, and Ben and I got to head into the Jasper Hotel in Melbourne's CBD. The event was run by festival director Steiner Ellingson and used to showcase the web series that were being nominated for the 2016 Melbourne Web Fest Awards, which runs in July. <laughs> Cast and production members of the various web series quickly filled the hotel function room as anticipation grew for the festival's nominee announcements. It's of a really high standard, like seeing that show reel before of everything that's coming in, it's like really, really cool. And internationally, there's so many really cool international web series, so um, again, yeah, we're, I'm, we're so happy to be, uh, to be involved in the, the, the team that's, yeah. Yep, um, so it's normally Melbourne Web Fest makes something to sort of introduce the whole, uh, the, the Web Fest, and this year they're doing uh, their own web series. So yeah, that's what I'm doing, and I'll be playing the main character. <laughs> so you're enjoying the evening? I'm having a fantastic time, and uh, Melbourne Web Fest and everyone involved is putting on an awesome night, and uh, everyone seems to be having a really good time. The beautiful high heels, you have to have a look at those high heels, they're awesome. I love them. Crazy. <laughs> Mr. Ellingson said that preparations for the festival began in January, closely followed by an internship program that began in March. We've, we've got a relationship with Latrobe University, um, got an understanding, a partnership and, and, uh, and a relationship with them where we take on board 15 um, interns every year. So those interns are working in three different groups in our organisation and a video production team, a PR team and a communications team. So um, yeah, it's the sort of the firm belief that if you bring people in from different works, walks of life at, as they're you know, establishing themselves as professionals, they get a sense of what it means to, to work together for a common good kind of thing and actually understand that they rely on each other in their future professional lives, which I think is really, really important. Melbourne Webfest interns were easily recognisable by their matching attire. I managed to get some sneaky interviews with them to find out how working for the Melbourne Webfest has been. This is this is your work for tonight, just yeah. press tweeting and yeah, pretty much. doing hashtags. Uh, tweeting and now deleting a tweet because I forgot to put the uh, image attached to the tweet. I would do. Dom, what are you doing here? Uh, so I'm on the communications team for the Melbourne Webfest and tonight is the launch where we announce which series have been selected. Awesome. What are those cards for? Uh, free drink tickets. So this is your job tonight, so handling out the tickets and stuff? Um, whatever they need us to do, we're PR interns so we do our jobs here and there, but our main job is to get this. So what is your personal challenge? How many tweets do you want to post tonight? Oh jeez, I don't know, I've been thinking one every five minutes, but I don't know, I feel like if I was doing Facebook, I could just do three, tweet, uh, three Facebook posts and then I'd just be done. But with Twitter, I kind of have to stand here awkwardly and just be like, oh, i got to keep going, i got to keep going. But, you know, it's good, it's challenging, it's fun. What are you doing tonight? Um, just helping out with the PR and checking people in and making sure people find their way. What can we expect for tonight, like on social media? Lots of tweets, lots of Snapchats and stuff? Yeah, we'll be everywhere. So Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, which is a new one this year. Um, and we're also going live on Facebook. In Woo, live! Yes, I'm nervous. I've never used it before, but we'll find out. How was it organizing the whole event tonight? Uh, there's a lot of lead up into this event. Not so not much the event planning, but choosing the series, because we had a record number of 230 submissions this year, which we cut down to 55 official selections and 10 spotlight series. So that was some intense spin watching of series. Interns for the festival perform various operation roles, such as PR, marketing, communication, and video production. It is a great opportunity for interns to get behind the scenes experience with an internationally recognized media organization and event. The festival runs for three days at the beginning of July and the whole team are eager to see their efforts come to fruition. I hope everyone else celebrates good. with us. High five. Oh yeah. yeah. There we go. Thanks. Awesome. <laughs>
weak. High fives high five. all, all around. Yeah, why not? Don't leave them hanging. That was way better. One here. Ben. <laughs> this has been Marilena Dahman and Ben McCready for Upstart Life. And to the audience. And that was Marilena Dahlman with her story on the Melbourne Web Fest. You're listening to Upstart Live, live from Latrobe every Friday. It is 15 minutes to two. I'm your host, Naim Kurt, and this is... Ben McCready. <laughs> and now we are turning to our editor, Rudy Edsel, who is the editor of Upstart Magazine. He will come to give us an update on some of the big stories him and his team have covered lately this week. Rudy, welcome to the show. I know, it's uh, nice to be here in the Upstart Bunker on this lovely Friday afternoon. What's the first story that we were going to talk about today? Um, the first one I wanted to bring up was Tracy Stewart's piece on uh, community legal centres and the recent budget cuts, the effect that they'll have on legal aid. There's been some protests around, mostly uh, mostly by uh, professionals, like legal professionals who are worried about the... There was a protest on Tuesday, wasn't there? Yeah, and was, I believe yeah. it was described as the poshest rally Melbourne CBD has ever seen. <laughs> Pearls, <laughs> barrister robes and wings, wigs mingled with suits and heels. Well, I mean, I mean, uh, if, you're, if you're getting protests from the, uh, the, the, the upper classes like that, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps that suggests that there is a real Society's social issue in, in hand. trouble. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that protest was led by the Supreme Court Justice, uh, retired Supreme Court Justice Betty King. And Tracy Stewart's story, did she talk to Betty King? Uh, well, she, she didn't talk directly to Betty King, but she did get some quotes from when she uh, addressed the crowd. And what was their protest about exactly? Uh, well, about the, the funding cuts to, to legal aid across uh, the federal funding cuts. Um, mostly they're taking out the, the budget formalised that they'll take out $35 million dollars uh, worth of funding for legal aid, which is about 30%, I think, a 30% it's cut. A, it's a huge number. I was just recently in court on Tuesday. I'm fighting a traffic fine for having my feet up on a chair. And without the help of, of legal aid, <laughs> of course <laughs> I was. If without, without the help of legal aid, you, you don't know how to navigate the courtrooms there, the Melbourne Magistrates Court. It's really confusing. It's Yeah, and that's, that's just on, a, that's just on a, a physical structural level. Like actually having to navigate the law, is it's beyond you know, s simple folk like us, isn't it? So it, it's really, a, it's an incredibly important role that, that legal aid plays. And, I, I, you know, on, on a personal level, I, I wouldn't, you know, I don't really uh, see why they would, I can't see a justification for the cuts. But she spoke to uh, the principal solicitor at Whittlesea Community Legal Service and obviously he was... Uh, you know, didn't want the cuts and uh, the Greens. That they've, um, we are in the middle of an election campaign. So what are the major parties saying? Obviously, the Liberals, the Nationals, the Coalition have cut funding. What is Labor and the Greens saying? The Greens, they strongly detest that. And uh, Bill Shorten said in his budget reply that he would uh, put the funding straight back. Fantastic. If they were to, they were to get elected. There we go. What's our second story that we've got? Uh, well, Kate Kelly went to uh, Latrobe's own panel on sexual violence uh, last week. And, and uh, she published a pretty, uh, pretty powerful story about uh, sex assault on Australian campuses. It was originally called uh, Australia's Dark Secret, but I couldn't fit that in the heading, so I had to, to chop the characters down a touch. But uh, yeah, so she spoke to quite a few people there. She spoke to David Morrison was there. She spoke to Dr. Nicola Henry. She spoke to um, uh, Heidi Lapalia, who's the national. Uh, Union of Students Women's Officer, and they've done their own. They're the only, actually the only body that c collates stats on um, on campus sexual assault, and they've uh, they've found from their studies that 27 percent of uh, Aussie uni students have experienced sexual assault while in enrolled at university. Which 27 percent. 27 percent. It's 27 percent, but that 27 percent isn't on campus. That's just whilst they're at while, university. Whilst enrolled in uni. But yep. of course, we know. As students, we've got so many friends at university and even outside of university, we're still hanging out with people at university. And there was quite a harrowing story, I think, with someone she interviewed under the name Rebecca King, who unfortunately was coerced into a sexual encounter with another couple. And even though she said no, she didn't want things to happen, sort of unsafe, practice, unsafe sex practices were conducted. And it really highlights the... Um, the difficulty we have with yeah, this issue. Yeah, harrowing, harrowing is a good word for, for that. That was really um, t tough to read, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's really it's a really a massive a massive problem that, that NUS, um, Heidi LaPaglia, the women's officer, she's, her exact words are that enough is definitely not being done by universities. And they, um, there was a 
um, a report, you know, a, a slated report shelved quietly that was meant to be take take in all of Australia's top eight universities, and that was sort of like quietly put to we one side. We did have a big interview with John Jewell last week, and he did say that the university, one of the big things the NUS wants to do is get better lighting around campuses so people late at night can't be preyed upon by people who might want to commit a sexual assault. And he said he was going to take that on notice about when Latrobe was going to install better lighting. Has anyone from the Upstart team followed that up? No, not not yet. We've uh, <laughs> we had quite a lot of uh, work to come out of that John Dewar story. It was an excellent interview. No, thank you very much. <laughs> what was the what's the final story we're talking about today? Um, well, Ben Kazupi did he did a um, it's, this is a bit lighter than the other two subjects. Ben yep. Kazupi did a profile on Nadine Rabar. She is the uh, she's the media manager at Northern Territory AFL. She's a an East Essendon Districts Footy League umpire. She's, she's a former La Trobe student as well, we should know. She's a former Trobe student, yep. Um, she's a published novelist. I, I mean, if you read this article, you'll you'll wonder, you'll think that she's got eight days a week to everyone else's seven. The woman is ridiculous in her output. Speak, speaking of this article, just props to Ben Kazupi for the writing on this article because it's fantastic. Oh, we were reading through it before the show and... and Oh, it's, uh, it's a beautifully written article. He's got it? a he's got a flair for for writing there. Yeah. As as editor, I'll get Ben Kazupi's pieces and and shed a tear of joy that I <laughs> that I don't have to do any work to them. <laughs> I think I've maybe edited five words he's written all semester. The bloke yeah. the bloke is just uh, outrageous. Um, but she's got a remarkable life story. She she actually she she gave a, a speech when she was I think sixteen. Um, that was so well received by her school that they published it in um in some kind of newsletter and then it was read by a publisher and the publisher offered her a book deal you know the day before her year 12 politics exam what, while so, she was in high school while she, while she was in high school so at the age of 19 or 20 she'd published her book called uh Jayana best and fairest which was sort of like loosely autobiographical about a, a lebanese muslim woman who wants to play footy but faces cultural barriers and and um, all that sort of stuff, and yeah, now she's moved on to umpiring, being the media manager at um, the EDFL. She's been a multicultural ambassador for the AFL, and she just goes and goes and goes. And yeah. uh, you know, I think uh, you should remember the name Nadine Rabar because she will be a very high up executive in in footy at some stage in her life. Yeah, apparently that's her plans. Look, thank you so much for for coming on the show, Rudy. Go everyone uh, listening at home, go check out uh, Upstart. Uh, magazine and all the the great articles that that they're writing over there that was just a taste of what they have to offer um so yeah so thank you very much rudy for coming on the show you're listening to upstart live we're eight minutes to two now coming into the studio we have toby and kyle who will give us the sports wrap up how are my boys going the north melbourne kangaroos we're eight nil at the moment on the ladder we're going to win another match this week and take it to nine nil against the uh the Inform Carlton Blues, and you've copped a few injuries. I think it'll be an interesting one to watch there, Kurt. We do have a few injuries. Our tagger, Ben Jacobs, ben is down. Jacobs. We've got Wells out. I mean, Sean Higgins. Sean That's Higgins cool. as well. But can we get over the Blues? You should. Uh, you're no, you're only side. as good as your last half. Last half. Oof. Yeah, well, last only half as good as your last half. Against Essendon. Bad luck. We'll, uh, we'll keep it with the AFL, who are, who are going to keep the controversial set shot countdown clock for the rest of the 2016 season. But they've made two major changes aimed at reducing deliberate time wasting. The shot clock will not be displayed in the final two minutes of each quarter. If an umpire believes a, de- a player is deliberately time-wasting, they'll now have the power to call them to play on. Controversy arose two weeks ago when North Melbourne's Mason Wood watched the clock count down near the end of their game against St Kilda. This is what the football operations manager of the AFL, Mark Evans, had to say yesterday on SEM. deliberately delaying starting a proper goal-kicking routine, then the player can be moved on, and hopefully that cleans up most things. But we put in a double layer of protection. Uh, we'll take it off the screen in the last two minutes of, of each quarter uh, for now so that we don't get a repeat of, of that match. Hawthorne star Jared Ruffhead is facing another battle with cancer after scans revealed a melanoma had returned and spread internally. He had been recovering from a knee injury and was only weeks away from a return, but he will now likely face at least three months of treatment. Roughhead last year had a melanoma removed from his lip but recovered to play in Hawthorne's premiership. Hawks teammate Jordan Lewis described the news as extremely serious and talked about the difficulty in his, his side faced ahead of their clash against Sydney tonight. It's harsh as you just got to move on in, in, a, in a way and... Um... And I think I think Ruffy would want that. Um, 
and and you've just got to what is what has happened has happened and and um, we've just got to beat it. Jared Hayne this week made the shock announcement that he was leaving the San Francisco 49ers and quitting the NFL. Hayne only decided to pursue a career in the NFL in October 2014. Instead, he wants to join the Fiji Rugby 7 side at the upcoming Rio Olympics. He was not named in Fiji's preliminary squad for this weekend's London 7s tournament, but he is in training in London with the side. And, uh, of, of course, Kyle, the biggest question for him is what will he do after the Olympics? And there's a number of NL sides that are reported to be chasing the former Dalian medalist. Uh, so far, Gold Coast, St. George, Newcastle and the West Tigers have all announced their interest. I think that'll be a pretty hotly sought-after signature. Yeah, it will be. Um, yeah, I've got no idea what he's going to do. Pretty unpredictable at the moment. But now to the NBA, where defending champions, the Golden State Warriors, have bounced back to win their Western Conference final series against Oklahoma at one apiece. MVP Steph Curry was on form as he scored 28 points to lead his side to a 118-91 victory yesterday. Curry looking for a shot. Fires. Yes. That's a three. <laughs> Just under three left here on the third. Oh, beautiful backdoor mm. feed. Curry able to shake loose, took it on the bounce. He has 28. In the Eastern Conference Finals, the Cleveland Cavaliers have taken a 2-0 series lead against the Toronto Raptors, winning 115-84 to in Cleveland. Kyle Lowry's poor playoff form for the Raptors continued, while LeBron James recorded a triple-double with 23 points, 11 assists and 11 rebounds. Meanwhile, the Socceroos captain Mo- Milay Jedinak will achieve something no Australian has before on Saturday night when he leads his Crystal Palace side against Manchester United in the FA Cup final at Wembley. He'll become only the fifth Australian to feature in an FA Cup final and the first to captain a side. Yednak has experienced captaining sides in finals, having led Australia to Asian Cup glory last year. That's our Friday sports report for this week. I'm Toby Chapman. I'm Kyle Humphreys. As always, and you're listening to Upstart Live. Thanks for having us, guys. Back to you. Thank you, Toby. Thank you, Kyle. That's right, you are listening to Upstart Live. That was our sports segment uh, coming out of La Trobe University every Friday. Um, Three minutes to two. We're going to have a, to finish off the show. We've got Alana coming in to do the What the What segment. That's the worst What the What introduction music, Matt. I thought we decided on the other music. What am I... A- it sounds like I'm a politician. You should what, just ro- be glad. Rolling up You're the only person on the show who gets an audio <laughs> intro so yeah, far. True. So that's okay. <laughs> that's pretty. That's pretty good. This this is Alana Mazurk. She's here to give us uh, yeah. what the what I believe. I am. I uh, found a story and I found incredibly interesting because uh, I know I would never spend my wedding night this way, but a Chinese couple has spent their first night of marital marital bliss. Why can't I say that marital? Uh, wedding night, uh, transcribing the Communist Party's 17,000 word constitution as a part of a campaign designed to shore up support for their president, Xi Jinping. I think that's how you say it anyway. But I mean, can you imagine being like, okay, we've had the best day. We're a little bit tipsy. We'll go back to the hotel room and write up a 17,000 word constitution. <laughs> how romantic. I know. That, that is exactly it how I plan to spend romantic. my wedding. So I... Uh, <laughs> They Don't stole your idea. <laughs> <laughs> they did. It's just like, it's crazy because it's a part of um, uh, the Chinese Communist Party co- constitution and it's a new initiative on, like launched March this year for an, the national education campaign. I just don't think you should put people's private lives into your national oh, uh, campaign. Yeah, it's that, a bit rude, I, a bit I rough. Mean, I hesitate to say that, that that tends to be some of the features of more yeah. communistic... Yeah, uh, Australia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of Australia, uh, I'm not sure if you watched the news last night, but two best friends, both in their 70s, were cr- up crabbing in Darwin, which is dangerous anyway. Why are you in Darwin? Uh, when their boat was nudged by the saltwater crocodile and it capsized, unfortunately, one of the men drowned. But the other man, who, like I said, was 72, Ray McCummer, uh, he took shelter among the mangroves and battled multiple co- crocodiles with spanners. What? <laughs> That's amazing. Spanners. Spanners. Like oh, he had wow. spanners in his little dinghy in his boat and uh, fought off. It's like something out of an action film. Yeah. Isn't it? I actually read this story. I believe it was also uh, 
um, spark plugs as well. Spark plugs, yeah. 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 Exactly right. Listen, we'll, we'll have to end it there. Thank you so much, Alana, for giving it's us... It's been um, another jam-packed episode. We can't fit everything in. I know. Afraid. Time is our enemy. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for listening at home. Thank you, Alana, for coming in and telling us what the what is happening. Uh, this has been Upstart Live. I'm Ben McCready. And I'm Niam Kurt. Don't forget to tune in to next week where we'll have stories on ADHD and the pay gap. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you.